السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلا أقسم بمواقع النجوم وإنه لقسم لو تعلمون عظيم إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين أفبهذا الحديث أنتم مذهنون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فاللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين رب العالمين I'd like to first express my shock at the crowd and my appreciation for all of you coming out tonight. Alhamdulillah, it's good to see you. I don't get to, a chance to come out to the East Coast, not to mention Maryland, Virginia area. This is actually pretty unusual for me. Second time in what, two months? Alhamdulillah. So recently I was in Baltimore. So I, I see some familiar faces here. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I got a chance to come here too. So I'm very happy that I did get a chance. And I, as a matter of personal allergic reactions, don't do MSA programs, so this is an exception. But Alhamdulillah, I'm happy I got to, to come and I'm appreciative of the MSA and their tireless efforts with my coordinators. Um, in this uh, program, the title of the program, Your Quran, Your Companion on the Day of Judgment, I wanted to take a sort of a step-by-step -step approach in addressing this topic. I don't necessarily like topics handed down. Um, I'd rather the Quran itself be the topic and the ayat themselves be the topic. Those of you that are familiar with one or two videos of mine on YouTube probably know that already. Um, but I, what I wanted to start with first is we, before we talk about Qur'an being our companion on Judgment Day, we have to talk about it being our companion here in this life. And this is really what it's about, you know. And, to, and before we even talk about our companionship with the Qur'an in this life, may Allah Azza wa make all of us companions of the Qur'an in this life. Um, we have to talk about, you know, what makes a worthy companion? Why would you want to have a companion to, in the first place? And what qualifies a worthy companion? You know, companionship is a matter of value. It's a matter of love, appreciation, like friends. The friends you spend time with are friends you like. You have, some, you have something to gain from them, and they something to gain from you. It's a matter of appreciation. It's a matter of understanding. Your friends a lot of times are people who understand you. You don't talk to your parents much, but you talk to your friends because they get you. Right? My parents don't get me, and my, you know, the imam doesn't understand. But my friends I can talk to openly. So there's a matter of open communication, a heart-to-heart -heart that's really important with companionship. That's why the Arabs have a saying, Ar-Rafiqu qabla tariq They say you pick a companion before you go on the road. Because right? if you're going to go on a journey and you get stuck with a lousy companion, it's going to be a lousy trip. So you be careful who you pick to be your companion. The same way the uh, interesting parables in the Arabic language, like they say, Al-Jarru thumma dar you pick your neighbor before you pick the neighborhood, right? So, because that's going to be your companion. You're going to be stuck with them for, a lot, for life. Now, we're talking about the Qur'an as a companion. And I want to share with you an example, an image that Allah Himself depicted, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Qur'an to help us appreciate what kind of companion the Qur'an is. Allah Azza wa Jalla, at the end of Surah Al-Waqi'ah, He takes an oath. Oaths in the Qur'an are very common. Allah swears by time, the sun, the moon, Wal-Asr, Wal-Shams, Wal-Fajr, Wal-Layl, Wal-Teen, right? wal duha so many oaths in the Qur'an. Even the surahs we heard today, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِهَذَا الْبَلَدِ These are also oaths in the Qur'an. At the end of Surah Al-Waqi'ah also lies an oath. Allah Azza wa Jal swears, takes an oath. I don't want, mean the word swear in the modern sense at all, okay? Swear as in taking an oath, okay? Now what I want to tell you about that is a, a little bit of an introduction, those of you who don't know, Oaths in the Qur'an have a very particular style, they have a very particular function. So you have to kind of be familiar with that before we talk about this particular example of an oath that Allah, Allah takes. Generally, in any language we take oaths. You say, I swear, pretty much on any, on any occasion. People say that to each other, I swear man, you better stop. I swear that restaurant, wallahi, is the best thing ever. I swear whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? People swear casually when they're talking to each other. They can be very serious and they swear, and they can just talk casually and they can swear. What's a more serious setting, you guys can call it out, what's a more serious setting in which people swear? They take an oath and they swear, they swear to whatever. Court, court, citizenship, anything official. In these official kinds of gatherings, these legal kinds of ceremonies, you have to swear to tell the truth, 
the whole truth, most of the truth, whatever, so help you God, you know. <laughs> but you have to, you know, so you have to uh, testify and in order for your testimony to have some credibility, you have to take an oath. The point there also is you take an oath because the audience that you're talking to is not so sure that what you're saying is reliable. And to add reliability to what you're going to say, it is supplemented, enforced by your oath. The purpose of you taking an oath is it gives credibility to what you're about to say. And interestingly, people who swear too much lose their credibility. <laughs> you know, like you have the friend who says, I swear, man, I swear, it was traffic. It's the only reason. Now you know, that guy who starts his sentence by, by, I swear, three or four times, has already lost his credibility, right? So never buy a car from somebody who says, I swear, right? But this, this particular case, Qur'an's case is something unique. There are a few things happening. The first thing that's happening is Allah is talking to different kinds of audiences. He talks to an audience that believes, and He also talks to an audience that doesn't believe, a skeptical audience. And so the benefit of the oath to the audience that believes is something else. And the benefit of the oath to an audience that doesn't believe is something else. To an audience that doesn't believe, it gives credibility. I'm telling you, I'm staking my reputation on this. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ nujum. And in interestingly, this particular oath, Allah uses the, the first person verb, I swear. لَا أُقْسِمُ I swear. Now I want you to think about this carefully before you call the answer out loud. For a disbeliever, for a disbeliever at the time of the Prophet wasallam, when he hears the Qur'an, he obviously doesn't believe it's the word of God. So who does he think it's the word of? If he doesn't think it's the word of God, whose word is it? It's the word of this man in front of me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa we do, right? But to him, it's just the word of this man. It's no different than that. It's, it's nothing else. There's nothing behind it. There's no source code. There's nothing behind it. What you see is what you get. So the only credibility he has to work with is what credibility? That man. For a believer, when Allah swears by something, we pay special attention to it because we're believers. Because when Allah swears, whose credibility is He calling on? His own. Allah Himself is swearing, Allah is calling on His own credibility. It has even more weight for us as an audience. Now hold on a second before I go on. There are people walking up and sitting down, which is extremely interesting, I understand. Which is why a lot of you are looking straight at them. And you will wait until they're finished sitting, so let me get that entertainment session finished, and then I will start again. It's okay, it's okay, it's not your fault. It's this thing that happens with people that are in lectures. It just happens. Wait for a bulb to flicker, watch what happens. 300 heads. <laughs> Why have I never observed the incredible nature of flickering bulbs before? <laughs> like, it'll happen, just watch. Okay, so. But regardless, what was I saying? Let's see if you remember. Allah is taking an oath. When the disbeliever hears it, and he hears, I swear, who does he think is I? The disbeliever thinks it's the Prophet The Muslim hears the words, I swear, from the Qur'an. Who does he think it is? Allah Azza wa Two different points of view, aren't they? To us, it's the credibility of Allah Azza wa To the disbeliever he hears, he thinks what? It's the Prophet himself putting his credibility on the line. Now the question is, did the Prophet himself, before he even became a Prophet وسلم, for 40 years, did he establish a credibility with these people? He did. So when he's staking his credibility on the line, it's not like he threw an oath out there and let's see what happens, let's, let the chips fall where they may. He has an established credibility already that he's staking his claim on. It's not something said in empty air. So there are two different audiences here, the disbelieving audience and the believing audience. Of course, alhamdulillah here, we are the believing audience. So when as a believer we hear the words, I swear, we believe that to be the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal. Now what does he swear by? I still haven't made my point about, about oaths, which is critical here. You see, when an oath is taken in Old Arabic, this is not done anymore. When an oath is taken in Old Arabic, the point of it is to get your attention. That's the fundamental point of it. I'm, I'm supposed to tell you something important. Guys, listen up. Before I say it, I don't want any of you to be distracted and doing something else. I need your full attention. So before I start telling you what this important thing is, I will say, I swear. Whatever, I swear blank. I swear to the mountain. I swear, I swear on your head. I swear, I swear by our village. I swear by tomorrow morning. That's how the Arabs used to talk. They used to swear by something, and whatever it was they swore by is supposed to get your attention. 
So if a dude walks into the Arab village and says, I swear by tomorrow morning, something bad is going down tomorrow morning, we better listen up. I swear by this mountain. You know what that means? Something's going on behind this mountain. We better pay attention. Must be a state of emergency. You follow what I'm saying? So the oath, the purpose of it was to get the attention of the audience. But the oath itself was never the point. That's not the, you don't say to somebody, I swear by the mountain. The whole village gathers up and you walk away. It doesn't work like that. Now that they're finally there, now you got to tell them why you called them there. The modern, more ineffective way of getting attention is like the guy after the Jum'ah prayer that tries to get your attention after Salat. Brothers and sisters, I have five very important announcements. The fundraiser is starting. And that guy, you know, <laughs> who can never get your attention. Yeah, that, that guy has failed. But the old Arabs had a trick up their sleeve. They used to use the oath. Now the Qur'an used it for that reason too. It did get the attention of the audience. So every time you find an oath, you find something that Allah uses as an, as an object to get your attention for the oath. Something that is important, something that's of value, something that is keen especially to the listener, and at that time the listener is the Arab in the middle of the desert. That Arab. He has to get his, the oath, the object itself, the thing Allah is going to call by, has to get his attention. But there's something more. Something that the Qur'an did that had never been done before. You know, before you just get somebody's attention and then you say something. Now what you have to say may be really stupid. It may not have any purpose. You could just get somebody's attention and say, oh, nothing. Like my kids do all the time. Abba, 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 abba. Yeah, what is it? Mm, nothing. Like <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> right? So just because you got somebody's attention doesn't mean you have something valuable to say. It's not necessarily the case. What the Quran did, however, is it took the object of the oath, the thing that was used to get your attention, and it used it to teach you something about the point that's about to be made. It used it as a prelude, as an introduction to the actual topic. So the oath isn't just there to get your attention, it's to get your mind ready for what's coming. It's to get you oriented for what Allah is about to say. That's what I want to show to you in this ayah. This is the, the reason I chose this ayah, and it has to do with companionship, it really does, as you'll see inshaAllah ta'ala. The companionship of the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa says at the end of this surah, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ nujum. I swear. No, all of your ideas aside, I swear. By the placement of the stars. مَوَاقِعِ nujum. مَوْقِعِ Where the star is placed and situated and it doesn't move. وَقَعَ in Arabic is for something to drop and it doesn't move from its place. Obviously we know there's such a thing as shooting stars. But you know in navigation there are some stars that the traveler relies on. Right? Whether they travel by sea, or the sea of the land, which is what? What's the sea of the land? The desert. When they travel at night by the desert, what do they rely on? They don't have GPS back then except what? The stars. The stars are basically the guiding stars in a journey. And they are stationary, they're in their place, and that's how the Arab knows he can rely on them. If they keep moving from their place, he can't rely on them for direction, you follow? So Allah says, in this oath, I swear by the placement of the stars. Now already we learned something. For these Arabs, believing and non, they had a lot of very clear understanding of what it means to call on the placement of the stars. Already what came to mind is not daytime, but what time? Nighttime, because you're talking about the stars. Also what came to mind is you would pay extra attention to the stars, not when you're sleeping at home, but when what? When you're traveling. So already the Arabs thinking about a journey, and the journey is happening in darkness, and the only source of light is? The stars. And he needs those stars because if he doesn't use them properly, he will be what? He'll be lost. He won't find his way. All of this is already running in the mind of the listener when he hears an oath has been called by the placement of the stars. It must have something to do with a journey. And it also must have something to do with navigating that, navigating that journey. Finding the right way through that journey. And relying on something that can't move from its place in that journey. All of this was just the oath. Allah hasn't yet told us why He got our attention. He's just gotten our attention using this oath. Now we're ready to take the lesson in itself. What is that lesson? Allah Azza wa Jal says, actually before He even goes on and tells us what it is, He does something He doesn't do anywhere in the Qur'an. He hasn't done this anywhere else in the Qur'an. He subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ It, if you had any idea, this oath I just took, Allah is talking now. He says, this, this oath I just took, if you had any idea, لو تعلمون, had you known? عظيم, it is incredible. It is huge. 
It is enormous. In other words, Allah still hasn't made His point yet, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Qur'an. And before He even makes it His point, He says, the thing I use to get your attention itself is so awesome. Not even my point yet. My introduction is so awesome. If you had any clue what I've actually just told you. You should just be lost in thought about what I just told you. You know Allah never does that with any other oath. Allah doesn't say, وَالْعَصْرِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ وَالشَّمْسِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ I swear by time. What a deep thing to swear by. Had you any idea, that's an amazing oath. Allah doesn't do that. He said, I swear by the day of judgment, the day of resurrection. If you had any idea, you, that's an amazing oath. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that anywhere else in the Qur'an except this one oath. This one time he swears. And he says, before you even go on to my point, you better appreciate what I've just taken an oath by. You should be lost in thought about this oath. وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ What is the entire subject of this oath? What's the point to which Allah got our attention? It's one phrase. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ no doubt about it. It is a Qur'an full of majesty, nobility, grace. I swear to it, it's a noble Qur'an. The entire purpose of drawing that picture in our minds was to introduce us to the Qur'an. And you know what's really amazing? This is not the first surah of the Qur'an. Many of you know what was one of the first revelations, or the first revelation. What was the first revelation, guys? Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. It's the first revelation. You would expect the revelation to be introduced in the first revelation. If Allah wants us to appreciate the magnitude of this revelation, you would expect that kind of grand opening to come in the beginning of the Qur'an. This is a middle Meccan surah, meaning a few years of the Prophet reciting the Qur'an وسلم, have already gone by. A few years have already gone by. And after these few years, now these Arabs have heard the Qur'an before. But it is as though Allah is saying, I think your understanding has gotten rusty. You need a reorientation, you need a refresher on what this Qur'an is. And I say this to you fully knowing that you're all sitting, most of you sitting here are Muslims. You and I need a refresher, we need to get reintroduced to what the Qur'an is, what it means to our life. I need it and you need it. This is so valuable that Allah made it a timeless part of His guidance. This is timeless, this, re this need for a refresher and a reappreciation of the Qur'an is timeless. So let's go back to that picture of a person traveling in the middle of the darkness, like you and me traveling in this life, surrounded by darkness. Surrounded by darkness. And in that darkness, we look for direction from anywhere we can get it. Sometimes we say, I'll just follow my friends in this dark journey. I'll just follow what I see some other people going that way, I'll just go that way. Some people will go this way and some people will go that way and people will take you in different directions. Some people even go backwards. But then there is a person who says, no, I need to get to my destination. I need to rely on a reliable source of guidance. The only light I will find in the middle of all of this darkness are the stars. And like the stars are the ayat of the Qur'an. The only source of light in the middle of a dark life. But Allah compares the, the ayat, the, the revelations of the Qur'an, to the only sources of light you and I are going to have in this dark journey. That's the only thing you can rely on. It's the only anchor that you, you can hold on to. Another image in the Qur'an, in another place in Surah Al-Baqarah فَقَدْ اِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى It's like he's held on to an anchor that doesn't budge. You know, in the middle of a storm, the ship can go here and there. So they drop the anchor when they're close to land. Right? Because so, the anchor doesn't move. So Allah says, someone holding on to the Qur'an is like someone holding on to this anchor. You know, the waves can throw you all around, but you won't. so long as you're holding on, you're fine. You'll be alright. This is the image given of the companionship of the Qur'an. If life is a journey, then our navigation is this book, is its ayat. That's a really powerful way of Allah Azza wa expressing the role Qur'an plays in human life. And He doesn't stop there. Fi kitabim maknoon. This incredible Qur'an, like these stars, you know the Arabs had very few beautiful things to look at. They woke up in the morning and what was part of their majestic scenery? Sand. Maybe a tree out there somewhere. So the tree was of particular beauty to the Arab because there weren't a lot of those out there. You guys have no appreciation of that in Virginia. You complain about the allergies, right? But where I come from in Texas, we appreciate trees. <laughs> so when I come here, I'm just staring at the trees on the highway like, wow, this is nice. Forgot what it looks, seems, feels like to live in the East Coast, you know? But can you imagine those, those you know, de these, uh, these Arabs in the desert? 
The tree was something incredible. And of course, the daytime is not a time to travel. Obviously, why not? Yep, they don't have SUVs yet. And oil hasn't yet been discovered in the Arab world. So there's two good reasons why you can't travel during the day. So the preferred time of travel is night. And the stars don't just provide navigation. The stars are something Arabs write poetry about. When the dude's obsessed with a girl, he compares her to stars. You know? To them, the stars are one of the few things they find in life that are what? Beautiful. Beautiful. They see the star as a decoration of the sky. To us, the Qur'an isn't just a means of surviving a journey. The Qur'an is supposed to be something beautiful. Something you gaze at like you gaze at the stars and just you're amazed. You're just amazed at how incredible they are. And by the way, something you'll notice about the stars, the more you stare at them, the higher they get. The more you stare at them, the more you realize, wow, that's really far. It just goes, keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. The more you stare at this Qur'an, the more you pay attention to this Qur'an, the more you and I reflect on this Qur'an, the higher elevated we'll appreciate it is. The, higher, the, the more we'll realize how majestic it is. People who don't pay attention to the Qur'an don't see its beauty. They don't see its power. The people who look at the Qur'an with attention and gaze upon its beauty, man, it just never comes to an end. It keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Just like that image, that simple image that Allah Azza wa drew. But the stars, subhanAllah, they're so high above us. And they make us feel so low, don't they? <laughs> they're such a magnificent creature up in the universe, up in the highest skies, and we feel so insignificant before them. That's what the ayat are supposed to do. Their grandeur and their greatness is supposed to remind us of Allah's greatness and therefore remind us of how insignificant we are. It's supposed to be a means of us getting humble. We're supposed to be humbled by the Qur'an. We're supposed to be put in our place by the Qur'an. How many of you have jobs here? I know it's a tough economy. Okay, how many of you have been yelled at by your boss? You don't have to raise your hand, you can raise your hand in your heart. It's okay, perhaps your boss is sitting with you or something. But okay. You know, when you get yelled at by an authority, it's like a, it's a humble pill. You just gotta take it. You just gotta, some, some, many, I don't know if any of you hasn't been yelled at by their parents. It's almost a religious obligation to get yelled at by your parents. And to just stand there and take it is a humble pill you gotta take. You just gotta take it. Especially when you know you're wrong and you're getting yelled at, oh, that's the best. It's therapeutic, I tell you. It's therapeutic. You come out of that and you're like, I'm never gonna do this again. You know, it's humiliating. That's what the ayat are supposed to do. They're supposed to put you and me in their place. We're supposed to stay in this journey, but not speed up too much, not slow down too much, stay on track, don't too many turns, don't take turns. Listen to the instructions. When you veer off the path, you're going to get scolded. Where's the scolding going to come from? The Quran. When you lose motivation, you need motivation. Where's the motivation going to come from? The Quran. When you're confused, where's the alleviation of your confusion? Where's it going to come from? The Quran. When you're lonely, where's the companionship going to come from? The Qur'an, subhanAllah. It's going to be your companion, if you let it be. And the more you allow it to be, the more you'll see its benefits. The less you allow it to be, the less it shows its benefits to you. It just doesn't show it to you. So you'll find people sitting in the audience saying, yeah, yeah, you're saying all that, what's the point? I don't see it. I've never experienced that, because you never give it a chance. It's not a free treasure that just opens its doors to anybody. You have to be worthy of it. You have to put in the time. You, you and I put in the time and Allah will open those doors. You and I don't put in that time, you will never see what a believer sees. You won't see it. You know, I've, I've met people that, that told me in their Parvez Musharraf accent, yeah, I've read the Quran several times. <laughs> no, you haven't, dude. <laughs> you know, you like my Parvez Musharraf accent? I could keep that up for hours. <laughs> I hope he watches this on YouTube. Anyway, so... Allah goes on and says, just because you think you have access, the, the Meccans have had access to this Qur'an and they haven't appreciated it. A few years have gone by, they haven't appreciated it. Allah says, just because you have easy access to it, the Prophet is among you, sallallahu alayhi wa The Qur'an from Jibreel is coming to you and being recited in your midst. Don't you feel like, like you're entitled? Like you get to have access to it, you can take it for granted. Fi kitabim maknoon. The source of this is a hidden, treasured away book. It's not just some trivial message that came to you. These words are expensive. They're high caliber. They're not just accessible to anybody. So the fact that you get access to them, have you appreciated what you just have in your hands? 
What you get to hear with your ears? Fi kitab maknun. And it's so high up. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. No one but the most purified of the angels get access to touch it. The fact that you even get to listen to Quran should overwhelm you with gratitude. That's what Allah tells the Meccans. Do you think He's telling us any different? You know? Yeah, just put this in perspective, guys. I don't want to talk about the Meccans in the desert back in the day. I want to talk about us right here. You and I are sitting in a car driving over. You pick me up from the airport or we're going somewhere and you're listening to the recitation of the Quran and chit-chatting at the same time. Have some respect. This word came from the seventh heaven to this earth. It's not something, it's not a five dollar CD you bought. That's the word of Allah. That's not a free MP3 you downloaded. That's the word of Allah. Show some respect. Turn it off if you want to talk. Or if it's being, it's being played, listen to it. فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Listen to it carefully and shut up. Literally, Quran's words, أَنْصِتُوا أَنْصَتَ means when somebody talks, you don't talk back. It doesn't just mean, you know, samata to be silent. أَنْصَتَ to be silent in response to listening to somebody. Listen respectfully, stay quiet. Allah says, when Qur'an is being recited, you will listen to it carefully, and you will remain silent. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that you may be shown mercy. In other words, if you don't do it, fill in the blanks yourself. I don't have to fill those for you, you're intelligent people. You want to be shown mercy? You better show this Qur'an some respect. You know? These were words even given to non-Muslims. This was warnings given to people who don't even believe. They were told, when Qur'an is being recited, you better listen. That's the authority with which Allah spoke. That's the book that we have companionship of. That powerful word. The master speaking to the human beings as slaves. He speaks with that authority. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't have to. You know? You know, sometimes your, your dad's yelling at you. Your mom says, take it easy on him. You know, take it easy on him. Or sometimes your mom gets really angry and your dad says, okay, 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 he's had enough. Or she's had enough. Back it up a little. Right? The, at least somebody's put you in check. It is Allah, the master, speaking to his slaves. He doesn't have to hold back. He'll call us out like it is. He will. But we don't, we have to, this is the first thing I wanted to share with you. An appreciation of what, it, what is the Qur'an. When we talk about the Qur'an being our companion, it's not just a book. It's not just one of the books sitting on the shelf. It's Allah's word. And it's Allah, Allah's word sent specifically catered to each and every human being. So no human being can say, I didn't get direct counsel from Allah. Allah's Messenger was sent sallallahu alayhi wa to connect us directly to Allah's word. And to prove that to us, Allah instituted a, 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 an institution, He put an institution in place for every Muslim, where we drop everything, we don't even look around. We stand right in front of Allah, and we recite the words that are His conversation with us, and our conversation with Him. That's my second point. First point was appreciating the greatness of the Qur'an. There are so many ayat that do that, I picked this passage. The second is to appreciate that the Qur'an in fact is a conversation. It is two ways. Allah is talking to us, and we have now access to the best way of talking to Allah. The best way of talking to Allah is to recite the Qur'an. To listen, to, listening to the Qur'an is Allah talking to you. You reciting the Qur'an is you talking to Allah. Fatiha is biggest proof of that than anything else. Is it not the Fatiha that we recite? Iya ka na'budu wa iya ka nasta'in. Ihdina. We enslave ourselves only to you. Does that sound like us talking to Allah or no? Guide us. Does that sound like us talking to Allah or no? The Quran enforces us to talk to Allah. It enforces us to do so. There are people in the audience today that are praying, but they're not really praying. They're praying and they're going through the motions. Right? They're going through the motions of salat, they're making wudu, they're facing the right direction, they're reciting what they're supposed to recite, or following along with the iman, imam, but they're, they're not really praying. If you paid attention to the fatiha itself, just the fatiha, there is no way for you to avoid engaging Allah directly in conversation. What religion does that? What religion does that? Allah Azza wa Jal began by praising, teaching us how, how we should praise Him. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. Enough praise now. Now you're ready to talk to Him. Once you praise Allah, you talk to Him. You tell Him where you stand. Ya Allah, I'm trying to worship you. I'm doing my best. Iyaka na'budu. Oh, but I'm not doing so well. I need your help. Iyaka nasta'in. And the journey is pretty dark. I need some guidance, some stars. Ihdina. 
as Salat al mustaqim But there's plenty of people that went the wrong, took a wrong turn here and there. Not their path, please. SubhanAllah. Every Salat is a conversation. If we understand the entire Qur'an to be that way, our perspective on the Qur'an will change entirely. And that's, I know, uh, I, I try to be conscious more so of the audience to whom I'm speaking. I know there's a very diverse audience here, but I'm appreciative of something of the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. It has a history of Islamic studies. It has a history of institutions, imams, halaqas, classes, courses, seminars, you name it. Much, uh, relatively longer than many other parts of the country, alhamdulillah. So generally, even the youth here have a history of either studying or even going abroad and studying and things like that. So generally, there's a higher level of awareness, relatively speaking, in this area, in this part of the country. And I appreciate that. But it comes with a danger. And the danger is that the Qur'an becomes an academic exercise. The Qur'an becomes a set of quotes from Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, and Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah, and Al-Tabari rahimahullah, and Al-Shawkani rahimahullah, and Zamakhshari, and all of these scholars and their quotes, that's, that's what your relationship with the Qur'an is. It's a bunch of notes that you're going to regurgitate in a halaqa. That's all knowledge, it's great, but that's all secondary. The first thing Qur'an to you and me, the real test of whether you and, or, you and I know the Qur'an or not, is whether or not we're using it to engage Allah in conversation in the prayer. If you're failing that test, all of that knowledge is going to waste. All of it. Whether you've studied Arabic for years, tafsir for years, tajweed for years, you can stand there and tell me which recitation that was, and which qira'ah that was, and who it's narrated by, and that qalqala was a little too short, or that, you know, madda could be a little bit, middle, little bit longer, or his light letters weren't that light, or his heavy letters were too heavy, all of that stuff is no good. If you and I are not in conversation with Allah, in prayer, in prayer, that's the real goal, in salat. Because that's the institution that Allah, that's the Qur'an training program that Allah put in place. That's the one that Allah put in place. That's the one that guides us in our journey. You know how in every journey there are pit stops, you take some rest? In the journey of life, Allah placed five stops in a day. You need to get fueled up again with guidance, now go. Now get fueled up again with guidance again, and now go again. Okay, now go again. We're supposed to get fueled up every salat. Every prayer, we're supposed to engage Allah in conversation. Through this Qur'an. That was my second point. To make sure we understand that the Qur'an, in fact, is a conversation. The, one example of that I'll give you, other than the Fatiha, and I'll move on quickly, inshallah, okay? The example of that I want to give you, there's so many to choose from, but let's just take the example of Adam, alayhi salam. And Iblis. Iblis. You know, what was, the, what was the Sunday school explanation you heard of Iblis refusing to do prostration before Adam alayhi salam? What was the reason he said no? What was his rationale? Very good. خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ You created me from fire, you made him from clay. Come on. I'm a citizen, he's an illegal immigrant. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not the same status. You know? There's a sense of superiority, not over Allah. He's not arrogant to Allah. He's actually arrogant to Adam alayhi salam. So he's perfectly capable and willing, fully willing to do sajda to who? To Allah. He has no problem doing that. Some narrations even tell us that he's been doing that for thousands of years. No problem. I just can't handle somebody else having authority over me. Somebody having a higher rank than I do. Arrogance as described in this story is not arrogance against Allah. It's arrogance against other people, other creation. Now think about it. Every time we think of shaitan, we think of a criminal against Allah. Immediately our mind goes there. And we shut ourselves off of one of the most important fundamental dangers that we're supposed to be warned of being arrogant towards other children of Adam alayhi salam. If he was arrogant to Adam, we are arrogant to other children of Adam alayhi salam. You know? SubhanAllah. And it, it, you don't have to be like a liberal or not that, you know, progressive or orthodox or, you know, conservative or Hanafi or Shafi to have arrogance. It has no school of thought. It embraces all of us equally. Why does that one have more YouTube hits than I do? You know? How come he became the MSA president? How come she's the treasurer? How come she bought that jilbab? I was looking at that first. 
It takes big forms, it takes small forms. But it takes its forms. How come I didn't get the first khutbah at the masjid? Why did they give me the second khutbah? Why did they give me the third khutbah? How come they invited me to the conference, but they didn't give me a first class hotel room? Who did they give the first class hotel room to? Who's going to be speaking at the main session? Is that guy I like or that guy the other guy likes? Who's speaking at the main session? These are not forms of arrogance. <laughs> You're kidding yourself. With a facade of religious activity, all that's going on inside is pushing one's own ego. When we read that story, it's not a story. It's therapy for your and my ego. That's what it's supposed to be. All the stories of the Qur'an are that way. Allah takes time, I can't help myself. One more example of that, okay? One more example of that. Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha. Musa alayhi salam is talked about so much in the Qur'an, I can't get enough of him. Alayhi salam. Incredible. How much attention Allah gave to Musa alayhi salam. In Surah Taha, Allah did something that he's not done with any other prophet. It's amazing. So Musa alayhi salam gets all the way up to the mountain. He's talking to Allah. And Allah tells him, you know, when you were a kid, your mom put you in a basket and she let you go in the river, and your sister was walking next to you, and then I got your mom to come back to you. Allah is reminiscing with Musa السلام, about his childhood. You know how you sit with a child and say, remember you when you were a kid I did this, 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 this? This happened to you, this happened to you, this happened to you. Allah is highlighting memories of his childhood that he doesn't even remember because he was a baby. Allah is doing that for Musa السلام, Reminding him of what you would think are just one human being out of so many. And his childhood incidents and these favors that Allah did to him, what does Allah teach us through that? You think Allah doesn't, Allah remembers the favors He's done to you and me. Who doesn't remember? We don't. And Allah has been doing favors to you and me since before we can remember like Musa alayhi salam. Since before we can remember, Allah has been doing things for us. And like He can recall them at any time like He did with Musa alayhi salam. He remember, we forget, Allah doesn't. لا يضل ربي ولا ينسى my master, he doesn't get confused, he doesn't forget. He remembers. We're the ones that forget the, the favors of Allah Azza wa Jal. He doesn't. The dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah, part of that is remembering what Allah has done for you. What Allah has done for you. To try and remind yourself of that. And the parts you can't remember, Allah helps you out with that. I was taking care of you when you were in the belly of your mother. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنَ His mother carried him. A burden on top of another. And then she fed him for two years. Now you listen to that ayah. His mother carried him a burden upon another. And she fed him for a course of two years. At the end of that, who should you be grateful to? Logically speaking, you just heard about the favors of who? Your mother. So you would expect immediately the words would be, so be grateful to your mother. Listen to the words. He says, Anishkur li wali walidayk. Be grateful to me. And then your parents. Because even when your mother was carrying you, she wasn't doing the actual taking care of you. She wasn't feeding you. Yes, her belly was it's on auto process, but that process was under my control. And when she was feeding you, the milk wasn't coming out because she commanded it to. I did. Thank me first and then your parents. That's what Allah teaches us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing that will help us build a relationship with this Quran is to remember it is in fact a conversation. All of it. It's a conversation. We have to approach it as such. It's therapy, it's advice. The third thing, and the final thing before I give you some advice on how to build this relationship, including myself. All of us need to enhance our relationship with the Qur'an. None of us can claim that we have a satisfactory relationship with this book. None of us can claim that. The third bit of, it, bit of introductory you know, attitude that I want myself and all of you to carry is that the Qur'an is what's called maw'idah. Maw'idah. Allah says, قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ what has come to you is heart-penetrating counsel. The kind of advice that gets right to you. You know, sometimes you hear advice from your friends and it just goes one ear out the other. Sometimes you hear a khutbah, you don't even know what happened. The guy says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu. Or out. Like that guy back there, I see if I can. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> right? But then there's sometimes a khatib is giving a lecture, there's a thousand people in the audience, you're all the way in the back, he can't even see you, but you feel like he's talking just to you. You feel like, how do you know, how do you know that? How's he talking to me like that? You feel like he's talking just to you. You know? Sometimes a friend gives you advice and it hits you right in the heart. 
It gets right to you. Other times it doesn't. Sometimes it does. Quran calls itself the kind of advice that penetrates into the heart. It goes inside. That's what it calls itself. Now what's the only explanation for the advice being heard and not getting into the heart? Something is trying to get access. The only possibility is the door's locked. If the door's open, it can go right in. So there must be the case, it must be the case, Amala Kulubin Aqfaluha. Maybe the hearts are locked up. They're not allowing the advice to enter. So we need to figure out a way to unlock our hearts. Because I tell you, in your life and in my life, we know when we hear advice that we know is true, that makes us want to change who we are and what we've been doing, you can't help but shed a tear. I don't care if that advice comes from your friend, your mother, your wife, your, you know, your boss, whoever. When, you're, when advice comes that hits your heart, you can't control your eyes. It, just, it, it doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't make a difference. The eyes start shedding a tear. When was the last time you and I heard the recitation of the Qur'an and the eyes couldn't help themselves? And if that hasn't happened, there's some indication, there's some locks that need unlocking. There's some work needs to be done. That hasn't been done, subhanAllah. That's the, that's the reality of the matter. All of our knowledge, all of our ibadat, all of our accomplishments aside, all the MSA programs aside, guys, the volunteers, I really appreciate you guys who put this program together. All this work, and you still can't cry in prayer, prayer you're still at a loss. And if nobody showed up here today, and you stood in before Allah and said, Ya Allah, I tried to put a program together for your sake, and here's one thing I got out of it. Today when I prayed Isha, I cried. Then it's a success. And that's all that matters. Really, that's all that matters. That for us to really truly get connected to Allah, that's the demand of the Qur'an. That's what it came to do. Shifa'ul lima fi sudur, a cure for what is in the hearts. How can the medicine take an effect if it's not even let in? It's got to be let in first. Then it, can, that can, then it can be cured. Then it can become a cure. So let's now talk in these few minutes we have together about how to at least practically build that solution. I like to talk, you know, when we talk about reminders, we talk about grand things. When we talk about advice, I believe in talking about advice from a very practical, even minimalist point of view. Things that you can practically do, and that's why I don't like to share much personally, even though I read them for myself for inspiration. I don't like to share stories of the tabi'un and the, and the sahaba, the companions of the Prophet who prayed the entire night, or recited the whole Qur'an in a week, or made dua and then it started all those stories. I don't share them. You know why? Because you know what happens to most of you when you hear that? Man, they were so awesome. I'm so bad. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of the... <laughs> Man, Sahaba were really cool. I'm so going to hell. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Let's start little by little. أَوَّلُ الْغَيْثِ قَطَرْ ثُمَّ يَنْهَمِرْ The Arabs have a saying. It says, if you, it's in many other cultures too. The first of the heavy rain is just a drop. Then it pours, right? Let it build little by little. The first thing you got to do is you have to discipline your life, people. I have to do it, you have to do it. You know what it means to discipline your life? Go to sleep early. Pray Isha and go to sleep. Don't go to the hookah joint until 12.30 a.m. Don't go see a movie. Don't go hang out with your friends. Don't watch Islamic lectures until 2 in the morning. Do not. It is not beneficial for you. Pray Isha and go to sleep and wake up early. Wake up before Fajr. Give yourself 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 I know it seems impossible. It's only impossible because of Netflix at night. Okay? That's the only reason it's impossible. Give the night life up. Let the night be for sleep. At least you're not accumulating sin every night. At least you're not burying your heart under more sin every night. At least you're sleeping. At least you're innocent for that much. At least that much. Then you wake up and you pray, at least start with a routine of praying Fajr on time. Start with Fajr on time. And the guys here, at least, at least once a week, guys, make it to the masjid for Fajr. At least one. I don't ask you every day. Just one day a week. Give yourselves one day a week. And you don't catch the second rakah right before the salam. Right? And then after you finish making it up, you're like, oh, masjid today. That's right. <laughs> You're like pointing at the right hand. You wrote that down? You got that? You got that? Pleasure? You're like, yeah, that. <laughs> Get to the masjid early. Let me tell you something about Fajr in the masjid. It has a spiritual impact that only people who go to it will experience. It can't be explained in a lecture. When you go to it, when you go to the prayer, 
and you sit there in the masjid quietly, and you wait for the prayer to start, and you sit there and you recite Qur'an, and you ask Allah to forgive you in those morning hours, and then you stand next to other believers and countless armies of angels, and you stand and you pray in front of Allah in that early morning, giving up your sleep, which only happened because you gave up your nightlife. When you do that, even once a week, the joy you will get out of it, you will, as you are walking out of the masjid, you will wish to yourself you did that every morning. I swear to it. I guarantee it. You're going to walk out of that masjid saying, man, I wish I could do this every morning. You really will. But start with once a week. Start with once a week. Don't make Friday night party night. You just came out of Salatul Jumu'ah. That's why the shayateen do extra heavy advertising for Friday night. That's why movies come out on Friday nights. Because they know they have to ruin one-fifth of the world's population's ibadah. They just went to Jumu'ah. How can we undo Jumu'ah? Well, there's a new movie premiere. Right? That same night. Let's get it all, all done with before its effects carry over even the weekend. <laughs> Right? Make Fridays a good time. You know, let, let that be a good time. That's number one thing. The second thing is every single day, I don't ask you to recite a juz. I don't expect that much anymore. One page of Quran. In Arabic, I don't care how badly you recite. I don't care how badly you recite. If you're embarrassed of your recitation, go in a room by yourself. Lock it up. But recite it out loud. Not silently. Out loud. And before you recite, if you don't know any Arabic, turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I'm reciting your word only for you. And you're the only one who can make it easy for me. You're the only one who can make it easy for me to recite it, to memorize it, to understand it, to love it, to pray with it. You're the only one who can do that for me. Ya Allah, and I'm doing this for you. You make it easy for me. This will be your personal time with Allah Azza wa Jal outside of Salat. Ten minutes is all it takes. But you need to make that, make that time. You need to make that time in your life. And as your love for the Qur'an grows, I won't have to convince you in a lecture to give it 10 minutes. You'll be sitting with it 20, 30, 40, 50, an hour. That time will increase for you. It will increase for you. But it will happen on its own. It will never happen though unless you put yourself in a routine. None of these things will benefit your life until they become a routine. You really want to have a relationship with the Qur'an? Start with reciting it. Even if you don't understand it. Even if, I'll say it again, even if you don't understand. Brother, I don't understand Arabic. I don't get anything out of it. Yes, you do. You don't even know what you get out of it. You're trying to imitate the words of Allah as He revealed them. You don't think there's a benefit in that? There absolutely is. My teacher, I asked this question when I was dumb, not too long ago. I asked my teacher, what's the point of reciting Quran? You don't even know Arabic. What do you get out of that? He said, let me tell you a story. This is my teacher, Sheikh Abdul Ghani in New York. He told us this story. He said, you know, a boy, he goes to the beach. And actually, he asked his dad the same question. I recite Quran, but I don't understand it. What's the point of me reciting it? So his dad took him to the beach. And he gave him a dirty bucket. It had holes in it, though. He said, go fill it up with the beach water. Go fill it up. So the boy goes to fill up the water. And he brings it back. By the time he brings it back to dad, what's happened already? And somebody goes, go fill it up again. So he sent him like five times, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He goes, Dad, there's no point, it's empty. He goes, yeah, but you notice a difference? He goes, yeah, it's clean. He goes, now you get it? He goes, oh. <laughs> now those of you who still don't get it, you're clearly on Facebook too long. <laughs> right? Your brains have melted. <laughs> right? Spend time reciting Quran. Then the third, just a little bit of, of, of practical recommendations for you guys. The surahs that you've already memorized, chances are they are from the 30th juz. Is that true? Surahs that you've already memorized, chances are they are from juz amma. One of my personal motivations to do an explanation of juz amma was just that. That if Muslims don't know the whole Quran, at least they know some things from juz amma. I, would, I don't say this out of my own, like to promote our program or anything else. I'm just giving you advice. If you guys can benefit from the recordings that we have of the 30th juz, don't listen to the whole thing, you don't have time for it, it's fine. Just listen to the surahs you've already memorized. Not a translation, an explanation of the surahs you've already memorized, the surahs that you're going to be using in prayer anyway. The ones you're going to be using in prayer anyway. So at least those surahs that you've been reciting since childhood, now you have a personal relationship and understanding of them. They've enhanced you in some way. Every time you recite them, it's an opportunity for reflection for you. It's an opportunity for you to get closer and closer to Allah's word. These things, we do them in this life. 
And if you can establish this routine, the last thing, I don't have a huge list of things. I'll review them with you too. First thing was fix your routine. Second thing was find 10 minutes to do what? Quran recitation. Quran recitation. Third thing was listen to lectures, if not mine, other people's too. Other shuyukh and scholars, there are plenty of tafasir available now. But listen, instead of, in addition to reading. I know you'll do reading, but most of you won't do reading. That's why I started with listen. You download it, you passively listen to it in the car. Okay? You're going to find time. When you start reading, you get through two lines, you'll fall asleep. I know. I've been there. <laughs> right? So instead of that, might as well, you're forced to stay awake, you're driving anyway, pop it in and just listen to it. Okay? It'll help you tremendously. That, that's the second thing. Now the last thing. If you can get this into your routine, then you add the next thing. Start memorizing the Quran. Even if it's one line, half a line, I don't care. Even if it's one eye for a whole week, I don't care. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, whatever it is, full 100% concentrated time on just memorizing the Quran. This is your little secret, it's between you and Allah. The more Quran you are memorizing, you're telling Allah, Ya Allah, I took, I, I, my heart contains three more of your ayat. Ya Allah, my heart contains two more of your surahs. It's enhancing your love for Allah, and it's enhancing your love for the Quran. And the more Qur'an you memorize, then the more Qur'an you study, and the more Qur'an you use in your prayer, and it's becoming more and more and more of a companion in your life. But it starts small. It starts with 10, 20 minutes a day. Nothing more. If you can fix your morning routine, best time to memorize Qur'an in the morning. Absolutely best time. But don't overdo it in the beginning. If you overdo it, like, oh, I heard this lecture from tomorrow, I'm doing tahajjah tonight, then I'm going to go to pray fajr, and I'm going to memorize Qur'an for two hours, that will happen one time this year. Okay? That's why you don't overdo it. Just take it easy, little at a time, it will build. Don't rush. Don't rush. Now, whoever takes their time will get to where they want to get to. Just take your time. Be patient with yourself and each other, and especially those of you that are younger, that are amazingly good at wasting your time, especially if you're in college. Find friends that you can do this with. So I want to, uh, I want to conclude, inshallah ta'ala. And I want to give you guys a little assignment, okay? Um, a lot of times we attend these lectures and these talks and they're... I don't want to... No, no, I just... I give it up. No. No! <laughs> just this now, okay. So a lot of times I give these lectures and talks and other people come and give lectures at masajid and programs and things like that. I want you to make a commitment to yourself. I told you that Allah describes the greatness of the Qur'an in which surah? Surah Al-Waqi'ah. I'll give you some ayah numbers. Everybody take it down in your phone, because I know you have them. Ayahs number 75 to the end of the surah. That's about a half a page of Quran. 75, ayah number 75 to the end of the surah. Memorize it this week. Memorize it for yourself. For yourself. Okay? Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Surah number 56. Surah number 56. You came to this program with the intention that you and I want to take steps further in becoming companions of the Qur'an in this world so we can be Qur'an's companions in the Akhirah. So how about we start? How about we start by making a commitment this week that we're going to memorize these ayat and not only that, at the end of this week, we're going to go to the masjid for Fajr and when we're praying the Sunnah prayers for Fajr, we're going to recite these ayat so we can show Allah we mean business. So we can show Allah Azza wa Jal that we meant it. That we do really want to come closer to Allah's book. And wallahi, when you make intentions like that, you take small steps like that, the steps that Allah will take towards you are infinite. The doors He will open for you, you can't even imagine. You can't even imagine. The joy Allah will bring into your life through the Qur'an is indescribable. The peace you will enjoy. Sometimes I'm just sitting there reciting Qur'an and I just have to just stop and just talk to Allah and I can't even do it in Arabic. I just say, Ya Allah, it's so amazing. This surah is awesome, Rabbi. It's so awesome. Ma a'jaba hadhal kalam, Ya Rabbi. What an amazing thing you just said. Rabbana. You know, I just can't help myself. Like, I'll tell you what, I, what happened last week. And I'll end my speech with this one, I promise. Yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah says, when my slave asks you about me, I am near, no doubt about it. 
I'll listen to the, the rough, coarse English translation. When my slave asks you about me, then I am certainly near. Who's you? Slave asks you about me, then I am near. Who's the word you referring to? The Prophet. Okay. So who's asking who? Who's asking who? Think about it. A less slave, a believer, is asking the Prophet. So who's going to answer if the Prophet is asked? Who should answer? The Prophet should answer. So if the slave asks the Prophet about Allah, the Prophet should say, Allah is near. Yes? He should say, Allah is near. Look at this. The ayah, the expected language of the ayah was, إِذَا سَأَلَ وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَقُلْ لَهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَرِيبٌ When my slave asks you about me, then say to him that Allah is near. Or say to him that I am near. What happens in the ayah in fact is, when my slave asks you about me, oh, he asked you about me, I'll talk to him directly. I am near. Allah didn't even give the answer through the Prophet ﷺ. The question came through the Prophet. The answer, Allah says, I am so near to you, I'll talk to you directly. Inni qareeb. No doubt about it, I'm near. I'm so near, I can just talk to you. Subhanallah. Just the shift. You know, he moved, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, this question, let me answer myself. He, usually he says, قُلْ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ لَهُمْ قَوْلًا بَلِيغًا You tell them, you tell them, you tell them. This time he says, he asked about me, I should answer myself. Subhanallah. <laughs> Just when it comes to dua. And that's the ayah about dua. That's the ayah about supplication, asking Allah for stuff. Allah says, I am near. فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دعان. I respond to the call of whoever calls. You know, these English translations, we read them, you miss the entire point. It says, I, I respond to the call of the caller. That's what the translation says. I respond to the call of the caller. You know what that means? Allah didn't just say here, the call of the believer. The call of the slave. Because the ayah began, my slaves ask you about me. So the expected communication continuation would have been, I respond to the call of my slaves. But he says, I respond to the call of the caller. Which means anybody who calls Allah, Allah responds. He doesn't look at their credentials. He doesn't say the only the believer, only the high, highly ranking, the ones who are very close to me. I respond to them. He said, whoever calls, I respond. He opened the invitation for dua. Now who's left not making dua? And incidentally, when somebody, is Allah someone who a lot of people call on? Sure. I'll give you a comparison. It's a hard comparison. To get the point across, sometimes I pick my girls up from school and they're all talking at the same time in the backseat to me. Abba, I want ice cream. Abba, I want pizza. Abba, I want a burger. It comes out as Abba, I want a burger. When I am being asked some things at the same time, do I even understand one of those things? No. And even if I want to, can I respond to all of them at the same time? No. Now imagine that's just me, and I want to respond to my girls. I'm a parent. I'm a loving parent. I want to respond to my girls. Now imagine the CEO of a company. He's got 500 employees, right? And each one of those employees asks him for a raise individually. Is he able to respond to each of them individually? No. Not individually. He might have, get somebody else to take care of it. He might see his employee, one of 500 employees, he might even know his, not even know his name. That employee might say, hey, I remember I met you at the conference the last year? And he said, okay, yeah, sure. He doesn't know, he's insignificant to him, right? What does Allah do about someone who calls on him? He doesn't say, Ujibu da'wata da'in. He said, Ad-da'i. The, not anyone who calls, the one who calls. In other words, the one who calls to me is very specific and known. He is special to me. He's not just anybody. Just that alif lam, that the in the ayah makes you and me special just when we call on Allah. He gives us individual attention. Special, particular attention. And there's no better dua than the dua that Allah teaches his slaves. You know, Adam Ali says, I know this was not supposed to be my last point, but I'm leaving you with companionship of Quran, so might as well. Adam is sent to the earth. He's embarrassed, he's humiliated. He's trying to find the words to apologize to Allah. Allah taught him the words to say. 
Then Allah gave, brought Adam into contact with words that he could use to repent to him. He couldn't even find the word, the right words to say sorry. Allah said, let me teach you the perfect way to say sorry. Here, use these words. And when he used them, Allah accepted his tawbah. You know what we learned? The best way to ask Allah is the way Allah teaches you to ask. The best du'as are the du'as of the Qur'an. The best du'as are the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. Learn those du'as. Boy, will you have companionship from the Qur'an. Will you have companionship? Next time, you're, those of you that are married, you're standing there and you're reciting, رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Husband and wife just got into an argument. They're yelling at each other. Yelling and screaming. And then the husband says, Maghrib time. And he goes and starts reciting, رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ our master, give us from our spouses and our children the coolness of our eyes, the source of our joy. The fight will be over if he understands what he just asked. It'll be over. If he doesn't understand what he just asked, the fight will get worse afterwards. Now that I'm done with Salat, now I'm ready for you. you know? <laughs> now we got all the way into Isha, baby. You know? <laughs> Companionship of the Quran is something very personal. All of us need work on it, myself included, nobody's an exception. And if we don't take care of it in our personal lives, if our children don't see it in our personal lives, they will see no value in it. And when they see no value in it, they won't even know what they're missing out on. And it'll be very hard to convince them later on in life. It's that Sunday school effect, right? If it's so great, well, how come you don't even come into the masjid when you pick me up? Right? It's that effect. The same effect will happen in your home. When the Qur'an no, gets no time from you, it will get no time from your offspring. And when it gets no time from your offspring, that liability and the liability of their children and their children and their children and their children that started with your laziness in mind is on our necks on Judgment Day. We will be answering Allah how we sat on this treasure that was given to us and we couldn't make time for it, but time for a movie, time for a party, time for hanging out with friends, we found plenty of time for those things. May Allah Azza wa really make us companions of the Qur'an. May Allah overlook our shortcomings in regards to this book all this time. May Allah Azza wa Jal give in our, in our hearts a never-ending love for the recitation of the Qur'an, for the memorization of the Qur'an, for acting upon the Qur'an and seeking counsel from the Qur'an. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless every one of our prayers with the gift of khushu' that, that, our, that our eyes remain wet because our hearts have become soft by Allah Azza wa Jal's word. May Allah Azza wa Jal take the good of the advice that is shared today and enter it into my own heart and all of your hearts. And may Allah Azza wa Jal remove that which is not a benefit from your hearts and make you and help all of you forgive me for those shortcomings. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.